Okay, who has seen the movie Braveheart? Who has seen the movie? Okay. Uh, Braveheart, it, it's the story of uh, William Wallace. And William Wallace was, uh, he was a man, he fought for independence, for freedom uh, of Scotland. He fought against King Longshanks. Uh, of, and the English, and there was a there was a gentleman by the name of Robert the Bruce, and Robert the Bruce would become uh, king of Scotland. But he he and William Wallace considered they Wallace considered him a confidant. Uh, he also considered him an ally and to some extent a friend. And while it's not completely uh, historically accurate, there is a scene in the movie where. William Wallace goes off, and he is chasing after Longshanks. And uh, what he does, there is a, a guy he's told to protect the king. And he turns around, and he's got the, you know, all of the, the chain mail, everything upon him. He runs back, takes his jousting pole, knocks Wallace down. And then when he gets over him, uh, Wallace turns around, grabs him, pulls off his helmet, and it is Robert the Bruce. And, and there is, if you've ever seen the movie, and, and I would challenge you, and if you haven't, just go and you can YouTube William Wallace Betrayed by Robert the Bruce. But the look on, uh, on Mel Gibson's face as he just, I mean, the, the betrayal that he feels as he looks here uh, at Robert the Bruce who's betrayed him, who's turned his back on him. And it just sucks the life out of him. I mean, you, you see it happen. And I, the reason I, I say that is I think we all at one time or another, we have been betrayed. We've all felt betrayed. It, it takes many different forms. Maybe it was somebody lied to you. Maybe they lied about you. Uh, maybe you had a confidence that was betrayed. You know, you said something to somebody uh, in, in strictest confidence, and then they turned around and they shared it with others. Maybe it was infidelity by your spouse. Maybe you were stolen from by a family member. I, I think we've all, we have all been there where we have been betrayed at some point in our lives. At the same time, I don't think that any of us can can necessarily sympathize or understand the situation that Joseph found himself in. We talked last week, beginning about Joseph and how he was betrayed, uh, the pain that he went through, but just absolutely bete- betrayed by his brothers. You know, we know that Joseph uh, went. Uh, he was he was the youngest of the brothers, the favorite of his father and uh, one day he was sent by his father Jacob he went up to check on his brothers and as he's getting up there you know what what happens they look they see him coming and and immediately they decide they want to kill him and so as Joseph gets there they grab him and, and, and imagine this moment here you are you walk up to check on your brothers and what do they do they attack you they take you to the ground. They tear off the coat that your father had given you. I'm sure that they, I'm sure there was some punching. There was some beating. They subdue him. Then they take him off and they throw him in a dry well. And, and what Joseph doesn't know at this point is something that we know if we've read the story. And that is that they intended to kill him. Originally, that was their goal. They were going to kill him. And And consider this for a minute. When you start to think about their hatred of him, we don't know if they were going to stab him, strangle him, stone him, what it was going to be, but understand there were no sniper rifles at this time. Well, I say that, you know, we can chuckle, but you realize that means that when they kill him, he was going to be looking in their faces. They were going to be looking at him as they did it. This is... This is personal. This is intimate. This is, this is a hatred that I don't think we necessarily understand. So they tackle him, subdue him. They throw him in this well. And then what do they do? They eat lunch. 
I mean, there's a, there, there is a callousness that is there, you know, as they, as they sit down to eat lunch. And, and why do they want to kill him? We, we read this in Genesis 37, 20. It tells us that, you know, their whole, kind of their goal of it was that if we kill him, then what will become of his dreams? Yeah, he had dreams, thought he'd be great. Guess what? We're going to snuff his life out. Don't have to worry about it. So they take him, they throw him in the cistern, and then they go over and they sit down, and they eat lunch. And I don't know about you, my appetite kind of goes out the window when I have just, you know, uh, beaten and stripped my brother and thrown him into a dry well. I, that just kind of, but I guess treachery and violence stirs up your uh, little bit of anger, there, or a little bit of your, you makes you hangry, would that be the word? Anyway. So. But they're sitting here and they're listening to him do what? He's begging to be let out. He's crying for mercy. And so as they're sitting there eating their lunch, uh, they see there's a, a caravan of, of traders. They're Ishmaelites who are on their way to Egypt. They're going to go sell their balm, their myrrh, their spices. And so they come along and, and Judah, one of the brothers in Genesis 37, 26, he says this. What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. Now, <laughs> I mean, he is our brother. Come on, what, what, what are we going to get out of it if we kill him? First off, we're going to be guilty of murder, and then we're going to have to cover it up. I mean, and that, you know, that's just a, that's a whole thing. So, and what do we get out of it? So here, I got an idea. How about if we just sell him? So we'll, we'll sell him to these traders and see, and really we're, we're killing two birds with one stone. I mean, he's gone. Dreams are finished and we don't, we're not guilty of murder. I mean, I, everybody wins in this situation, right? So they sell him. Caravan comes up, they sell him for 20 pieces of silver, and then off uh, he goes. So it's like no more dreams, they rip him out of the cistern, 20 pieces of silver, he's gone, he's being led away. As he's being led away, what do they do? They pick up the coat that they had ripped off of him, they kill a goat, they drain its blood, and then they begin, they take the coat, and they dip it in the goat's blood. And so while, think about this, as Joseph is being led away, to Egypt where he's going to be sold into slavery what do they do they go back to their father and they take him this torn and and tattered blood-soaked coat and and they hand it to Jacob and they say examine this and see if it is your son okay do you pick up on a little bit of I mean, just hatred and hypocrisy here. It's not even a, hey, isn't this our brothers? Not, is this, they don't even want to say his name. I mean, it's so cold. Examine this and see whether it's your son's robe. They don't even want to say his name. And so at this point, you know, they've, they've doubled down on their, on their hatred and their deceit. Jacob is, is now mourning the loss of his son. His favorite son, in his eyes, is dead. And what's going on? Joseph is taken to Egypt where he is sold to a man named Potiphar. Now, here's the deal. If, if you are being sold as a slave, Potiphar's not the guy that you want to win the auction. Okay? He is the... He is the Pharaoh's policeman, okay? He, he's the captain of the guard, governmental uh, employee. And so what we know, though, is that as captain of the guard, he is used to being in charge of prisoners. He has no problem. He's dealt with outcasts. He's dealt with criminals and everything else. He has no problem treating them as such, okay? In other words... Potiphar's not a nice guy. He's not the benevolent grandfather, okay? And so he's not the one that you want to be sold to. 
And, and so here you've got where in one day, what has happened? In, in, in one day, we have got Joseph going from being the favored son of his father, Jacob, who was a wealthy landowner, and now he is the lowliest slave in the Pharaoh's captain of the captain of the guard, Potiphar's household. Okay? And and I think that a lot of times, you know, we look at this and, and we read these scriptures, and I think this is what we need to understand is that Joseph finds himself facing two paths. Okay? I, from the moment he was thrown into the cistern. What path is he going to choose? Because he can either, he can descend into depression and, and darkness, uh, distrust of everyone, anger, bitterness, loneliness, hopelessness, and, and all of the baggage that comes with it. And, and honestly, the, as you look at this, is there anybody here that would have blamed him if that is the way he would have responded? I, none of us would. I mean, he's been betrayed and abandoned by his own flesh and blood. And now he's living as a slave in, in a land that he, I mean, a strange land, serving a man that he does not know. I, there, I mean, nothing. Society, culture, everything is completely different. And so I think, you know, despair and depression kind of seem like a logical path don't they at this point but the other choice is to remain faithful to God and and that is what Joseph chose to do he he didn't get bitter he didn't let anger and and hatred take root in his heart he didn't sink into depression he didn't sink into you know despair he didn't give up hope he remained hopeful he remained faithful Throughout every bit of this, in, in spite of uh, the betrayal that he faced, he remained faithful to God. I, I know these words were written thousands of years after. Uh, you know, Paul wrote these thousands of years after. But I think Colossians 3, verses 22 and 23, uh, Paul, Paul could have been writing this too and about Joseph. When he said, slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything. And do it not only when their eye is on you and to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Verse 23, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. I mean, there's a lot of obstacles in the way for Joseph. He doesn't know the language. He, he doesn't know the culture. He doesn't understand how everything works. He's the, he's the lowliest guy on the totem pole. But instead of wallowing in pity, instead of complaining, instead of protesting, instead of just doing the absolute minimum so that I could get by and stay out of trouble, what does he do? He applies himself. And he goes to work. He, he learns the language. He learns the customs. He learns the culture. He, he watches how Egyptian society and the system works. He takes on responsibilities. When he does, he succeeds at them. And when more responsibility comes his way, he takes on more of it. He takes on a leadership role. And, and like I said, you know, he, no, he didn't know the language. He didn't know. There's so many of these obstacles that are against him. But like I said, I think that, you know, Joseph's response is pretty, it's like, yes, sir. No, sir. What else can I do, sir? Very much so. I mean, he, he adapted and, and he simply applied himself. And we know because the scriptures tell us that what the Potiphar noticed. Potiphar was, the Bible tells us that Potiphar was blessed in the fields. He was blessed in his home because of Joseph. And he noticed it. He looks at Joseph and what does he see? He doesn't see a whiner, doesn't see a complainer, doesn't see, you know, a lazy guy. Instead, what he sees is a man who is intelligent, a man who is studious, a man who applies himself, who works hard, and who is a leader. And so he just keeps putting responsibilities on him. And Joseph keeps gobbling him up willingly 
until what? The only thing Potiphar worries about in his entire house is what he's going to have for dinner. That's it. Other than that, Joseph is in charge of his entire household. And, but there, there's something else here. You know, we, one, we talk about being faithful and trusting and the fact that, that Joseph, you know, went to work, that he didn't get down, he didn't get, you know, he didn't fall into despair, depression, hopelessness, you know, anger, bitterness, all of that. But there's something else as well, and that is the fact that Joseph never forgot who he was and where he came from. I mean, he, yes, he learned the new language, but we know from later on, he never forgot his native tongue. He never abandoned it, okay? He learned about the culture. He learned about how, you know, things worked uh, in Egypt. He learned the system and, and everything else, but he never lost sight of the fact that he belonged to God. I mean, yes, Potiphar may own the rights to Joseph, but Joseph knew in his heart, ultimately, I'm God's possession. He, he never forgot where he came from. He never forgot who he was. He never forgot whose he was. And, and that's, I think that those two keys are what we see when it talks about being faithful in spite of betrayal. And, and I think this is where, this is where we come into the picture, okay? Because I, we've all been hurt. Like I said, we, we have. We've all had, somebody has lied to us. Somebody has lied about us. Somebody has betrayed uh, a trust. Somebody has uh, abandoned us. You know, we've had that time when we've been let down by somebody that we care about, somebody that we love. And it hurts, doesn't it? It's painful. It, it makes us, when that happens, it makes us angry. And, and it's easy to allow ourselves to get bitter. But I think that here's where some of this kind of comes full circle. And, and this is where the, the deeper issue actually ties into uh, our message and, and the passage. Because a lot of times I think that it may have been people that hurt us, but we tend to focus our feelings of betrayal on God. We get hurt by someone we care about, and we feel like God is the one that turned his back on us. We are betrayed, and instead we focus it and feel like it was God who betrayed us. And, and I, if anybody had a right to feel that way, it would have been Joseph. I mean, think about it. Here's, Joseph, as a young man, had two dreams, two prophetic dreams given to him by God, and, and although he didn't know, you know, everything about how those dreams would turn out, I think it is safe to say there was nothing in those dreams that led him to believe that he would be at this station of life. I think it looked far different than, than what he thought, okay? He, he had dreams about sheaves of grain bowing to him, the sun and the moon and the stars, and now he is a slave in Potiphar's household. I, those two don't compute. I mean, in fact, that's we go back. Genesis 37, 20. What did his brothers say? They sold him into slavery. They were going to kill him. Why? Because they wanted to end these dreams that he had. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. I, I don't think that there was anything in his life right then that said, oh, yeah. God's fulfilling this right now. I see it happening. And, and that's the thing is that instead of turning, you know, and instead of turning it and feeling like God betrayed him, because here's the deal. When the wheels come off the bus, you know, when life takes a, a nasty turn, and I think it is easy for you and for me to fall into the trap of believing that somehow God has betrayed us. And somehow he turned his back on us. Because what we say in our quiet time, whether we say it out loud or not, is, you know, if God really cared about me, he'd have kept me out of this situation. Right? 
if God really loved me, he would protect me from this hurt and from this pain. You know, when, when the surgery doesn't fix the problem but actually makes it worse, we feel like somehow we've been betrayed. You know, when, when we don't get the job that we always wanted. When, when our marriage falls apart in divorce, we feel like God's turned his back on us. We feel betrayed, and, and we don't know anywhere else to place it. Yes, it was people that hurt us, but somehow we feel like it's God who betrayed us. And so we get angry at him because of what's been done to us. Joseph did not do that. And it shows in his life, I Bob Russell tells the story of a young girl who had, she felt like God was leading her to be a missionary to China. That was all she wanted to do. She, she wanted to be a missionary to China. She, she worked towards that, saved towards that. Everything she did was aimed at, at that goal in life. And, and the time came where it was actually, it was the week of, she's supposed to be getting on the ship. And she is going to head over to China uh, to be a missionary. And that week, she gets a message that her mother had suffered a significant stroke and that she needed to come back home. So she canceled the trip. And she went back home. And sudden, instantly, she became the caregiver for her mother. But she also became the mother to her five younger siblings. And for more than 15 years, she took care of her mother and raised her brothers and sisters. And even though she tried to retain her, her trust and her faithfulness in God, she also struggled many times to understand why it is that God would deny her the opportunity and you know this desire that she had to be a missionary to serve the people of China in the name of Jesus. But her, her selfless attitude and her actions never went unnoticed. Of her five younger siblings, one became uh, just an amazing preacher. One became a fantastic teacher. Two of them became missionaries one of them in China, where he had an effective, I mean, tremendously effective ministry for more than two decades. The question is, how, how do you respond when God interrupts your plans? How, how do you respond when when you don't get the job you always wanted? How do you respond when you don't get into the college of your dreams? How do you respond when the love of your life marries somebody else? How do you respond when your marriage ends in divorce? How do you respond when life doesn't turn out the way that you had it all planned? And I, and I think key word, there's two words to this. Trust and time. And these really are the keys to, uh, these are the keys to Joseph's story. Trust and time. Trusting. Trusting that God's ways truly are higher than our ways. That's the first. Trusting that, that God is working, that God is aware. You know, Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6 says, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Okay? That, that's what, trusting God is trusting that he will do that. It is, 
But as you read that, you know, there's nowhere in there, and I don't find it anywhere else in the Bible, that God makes a promise that what he's going to do is automatically fast forward you to the end. What he says is that, that he will acknowledge him. He will make your path straight. He will level the road. He will clear the road in many ways. He will take the curves out, but you still have to walk and take that journey. But what he also promises us is that as we walk that journey, we never ever walk it alone. That he will never forsake us, that he will never leave us, that he never leaves us on our own, weak and with no power, that he is always with us. That's what he promises us, and, and, that's, what, and that's what trusting God is. It's trusting, number one, that we're going to go through things, but it is trusting God in the fact that he will always be there with us, and trusting in the fact that, that what we know when the Bible tells us that in all things God is working for the good of those who love him. Those who have been called according to his purposes. That he is going to, through our pain, through our hurt, through our betrayal, he is going to bring about good for us, in us, but ultimately for his glory. And that's what trusting him is all about. But the second is time. There's two words, trust and time. God does not settle his accounts at the end of the month like we do. But he always settles his accounts in his time. And, and that's hard on us. It really is. Because when, when it's in his time, then, then that removes our ability to determine the who, what, when, and how. We, we, don't, we don't like that. But the fact is that God always settles his accounts in his time and in his ways. And, and that's what trusting him is all about. That's what, that's what Joseph did here. And, you know, it's, I've heard it said that faithfulness is about trust and time. But the, like I said, the Bible tells us, with the Lord, a day is a thousand years, a thousand years is as a day. Okay? So he's going to settle it in his own time, in his own ways. And, I, and, and here's what I was thinking about. We go back to the story of Joseph. We, we read so many times that there was a caravan of Ishmaelites that came passing by. And we think, man, what a stroke of luck that they came by at just the right time. That wasn't a coincidence. That was a God incident. To quote, Bob, I, I love Bob Russ when he said, that wasn't a coincidence. That was a God incident. Those traitors, I think, really, I, to me, they are there, yes, to prove a point, but also to remind us that it is always best to trust God. That it is always best to trust His ways and to trust his timing. Because you know we may not feel it. But God is working. We may not see it. But there is always a bigger picture. And, and we may not always understand why it's happening. But God does. He knows why it's happening. Isaiah 40, 31. Reminds us that. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. That they will soar on wings like eagles. That they will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. You may be here today and, and you feel like you really can't go on. You've been betrayed. You've been lied to, lied about. Something's happened. Somebody's left you. Somebody's abandoned you. And, and you feel like your life has kind of turned into this, uh, just a, a long tunnel with no light at the end. You're filled with mistrust. You become cynical. You're, you're bitter. You feel like God has turned his back on you. You may be in the middle of, I mean, a long, painful season of life, and you don't see how anything good comes out of it. Maybe you can't point to a particular person that hurts you but you just wonder when in the world this is ever going to end those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength they'll soar on wings like eagles run 
and not grow weary. There's a reason that, that the Bible tells us that we are to trust in the Lord and lean not on our own understanding because we don't get it, we don't understand it, but to acknowledge Him in all things. See, it's easy when we begin to hurt to lash out. I, I don't know what you're going through. I have no clue. Let's be honest. Some of you, I, I know what's going on. But I'm pretty sure that as you're sitting here, you're, you're looking at me and you're saying, you know what? Preacher standing up on the stage has no clue how bad it is. He has no clue how bad my life is. He has no clue what they've done to me. He has no clue what I'm enduring. He has no clue the pain, the betrayal, the hurt that I am going through. And you know, I'm going to tell you, you're probably right. I don't. I don't know everything that's going on in your life. I don't know everything that you are feeling. I don't know how, I don't know how depressed you are. I don't know how in despair you are. I don't know how hopeless you feel. But I want to tell you this. He does. See, he knows exactly what you're feeling right now. He knows exactly what you are going through right now. And I'm here to tell you, God loves you. He loves you and he sees you. And he wants nothing more than to walk this journey with you. He don't want to watch from afar. He wants to walk beside you. He's going to go before you where you need him to. And he's going to stand behind you when you need him there. That is what our God does for us. And we've all been there. We've all been betrayed. We've all had times when we, when we were hurt. And so many times when we talk about when we talk about telling God that we love him, what do we immediately think of? We do it when we pray. We do it when we sing. We do it when we praise. I honestly believe some of the times that are the most effective and impactful of telling God that we love him are the times that we just keep putting one foot in front of the other day in and day out, even when it is painful. When we go forward, even though we don't feel like it. When we get up and we keep moving, even though it, it's not the thing that excites us. Because we know faithfulness has been defined as long obedience in one direction. I think the way we tell God that we love him is when we are faithful to him because we know that he is faithful to us. I don't know what you got going on right now. I'm going to ask you to stand, and we're going to have our time of decision. But I, I want you to do me a favor. Kevin, if you would kill the lights. And as you stand, I would like everybody, I want you to do me a favor. Bow your head and close your eyes. And I'm going to ask, the, seriously, everybody, bow their head and close their eyes. And if you are here today, and you have been betrayed by somebody and it weighs on your heart. Would you do me a favor? Eyes are closed and, and heads are bowed. Would you just raise your hand if you have been betrayed by somebody and it still hurts? Just raise your hand. Leave your hand up. If you are here today and you feel like there has been a time where you feel like God has just turned his back on you. You look up and you wonder, where in the world is he? I need him, but you don't feel like he's there. Would you raise your hand? Maybe you're here today, and you just, you don't necessarily want to go forward. Every step is painful. And you don't know what the future holds. If, if that is you, I want you to do it. Raise your hand, please. I want you to leave it up. And I want to pray with you. And then we're going to have our time of decision. Our prayer rooms will be open. If you want somebody to pray with you, you just step into one of them. If you have a decision to make, then I invite you to make it. But would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, I'm asking right now 
that these hands that are raised would feel your hand holding theirs. That God, we would know in this moment that you never, ever ask us to walk alone. That you have promised you will go with us. That you are beside us. That you will strengthen us. That you will empower us. But God, above all, that you see us. That you care about us. That you love us. You've never left us. You've never forsaken us. You've never turned your back on us. God, I just ask that we would in this moment know that. That we would cling to that. God, we want to be faithful because we know you are faithful. We want to trust you because there's nobody else that we can completely trust with everything. God, I just ask that you would, you would bring comfort to those that are searching for it right now. God, that you would bring encouragement to those who, who don't know how much longer they can go on. God, that you would apply just a balm to the hearts of those that have been hurt and betrayed. God, that you would push back and, and break the bonds of, of bitterness and anger that seem to well up when we feel like we have been hurt. God, we just seek your presence. We seek your spirit and ask you to work in your way and in your time in our lives. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.